are you guys doing? I feel like I just want to squish you all right here. I think we could all just fill up one roll and make it look really packed here. <laughs> oh, well, um, let's, let's stand together. I just wanted to first brag on my kids a little bit because they're like songwriters already. So you guys know how I shared Jesus Loves Me a few weeks ago or whenever that was. Well, this is the verse that my, my son and daughter started writing. Now, I did help it rhyme, just to be clear, but they wrote this verse um, for Jesus Loves Me. And I just, I was like, we all need to hear this. This is so encouraging for us. Remember, they're three and four. So if they know, we need to know too. <laughs> Jesus is coming for me. Where he is, I'll also be. Jesus is coming for us. So we'll all be with Jesus. <laughs> Yes, Jesus is coming. Yes, Jesus is coming. Yes, Jesus is coming. He's coming back for me. <laughs> so as we wait for Jesus, just remember, he is coming for all of us so that we can be with Jesus. It's really that simple. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus, we just, we thank you. We thank you for the mouth of babes that reminds us how simple it is that you would come so that we could be with you, so that you could come and rescue us the way you love doing. And Lord, I just ask that your presence would fill this room. I ask, Lord, that you would, you would help us to remember that we are not, we are not worshiping for one another, but we are worshiping for you, the King. And that we are, as this first song says, we're joining a song that's already in heaven, Lord. What a what an awesome invitation that we get to join something in heaven. And uh, wow, <laughs> I wonder what that looks like. So Lord, we just thank you. Jesus, you're beautiful. And we thank you that we can come before you. We thank you for your kindness and goodness and all you're doing. And uh, we just ask for your hand of protection over those who are still on their way, that they would get here safely. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
satisfied for here my heart is satisfied within your presence I sing beneath the shadow of your wings 
How about now? <laughs> check, 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 check. Hello? How about now? We okay? Let's pray that this never happens again. Jesus, you alone are worthy. You alone are holy, holy, holy. Son and Holy Spirit, we we worship you, we praise you, we thank you, we glorify your name. How appropriate tonight to begin with the song of children and to end with the holy, holy, holy. The the Lord, the purity just of singing those last lines together, um, and the, the innocence of the children's lyric. And Lord, when we are able to gather in song before you. It, it is such a privilege, such an honor to gather and honor you. Such a blessing to come together and bless you. And Father, we just pray that all praise and honor and glory that is in our, our hearts to give would be given to you and, and received by you, that you be lifted up above all others, the name above all names. We praise you, Jesus. And we want to continue that. And so tonight, even as we head into this, this section in the book of Revelation, I pray that our praise would continue. Our hearts would continue to lift you up. The words of the passage that you have before us would be encouraging and building in faith, but, but would be a praise. Because, Father, what I know and we're about to find out here as we study the rest of Revelation 11, this is a song of praise. And we're going to enter into that praise and worship tonight. So, Lord, would you keep our hearts in tune with you and our minds and our thoughts praising you continually as we come to your word tonight. Holy Spirit, what is needing to be taught, what is needing to be understood, what you want to reveal and desire to reveal to each of us, I pray that you will bring and that we will simply be open vessels. I had a, 
My dear brother, text me, Lord, today, you know, I'm just saying I am just a, a broken, empty vessel. And Lord, that's the best way for us to approach you, that we are just empty vessels. We don't have anything to bring but ourselves, but we come to you open and willing and just saying, Jesus, if we are to be filled with anything, may it be your spirit in your glory and praise. So we invite you to do that, ask you to do that, uh, Lord, tonight as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to be in Revelation 11. Ladies, I want to mention to you, because I have a little sticker here to remind me, registration closes tonight for the women's event this Friday night. Okay? So you can see uh, Brandy, but they're, they're gonna, there's only there's limited space. So that uh, if you want to be there Friday night, make sure you talk to Brandy Orieva to sign up tonight by 9 o'clock, which means if I teach past 9, you're in trouble. Oh, come on. I'm just kidding. We're going to have the lights on. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, picking up in verse 15. Ready? Revelation eleven fifteen. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, "The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever." And the twenty four elders, remember them, who sit on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying. We give thanks to you, O Lord God, the Almighty, who were and who, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which was in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. So halfway into the seven-year tribulation, we are at the exact midpoint because at this point, the seventh angel sounds the seventh trumpet. We could call this the cornet coronation of the kingdom come. Because he blows the trumpet, and what we get here in this small little section is a power-packed coronation of the Christ and the coming kingdom. A, a, a moment of, of exuberant worship in heaven where John witnesses the heavenly declaration of the rule of King Jesus. We're already there. Wait. I thought we were at the midpoint. I thought you said we were three and a half years in with three and a half years left. And that's right. In fact, according to the beginning of the chapter, if you look back at verse two, it says they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months, 42 months left to go. Three and a half years yet to come that is before or, or actually after this moment. And it's this passage more than any other that has caused some to speculate a mid-tribulation rapture of the church. People read this. They hear the trumpet sound. They equate the seventh trumpet with the last trumpet. It's not the last trumpet, but they will equate the two and say, well, look at this. I mean, this is the point where the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. That's got to be the moment when the church is caught up. But that would be a miscalculation of what's going on here. Now, when I taught this three times ago, going through Revelation, I was a little more cautious. I was a little more, you know, open to other ideas. The more I teach this, the less I am. Not, not that I'm closed-minded, but the more convinced I become of the literal understanding of the book of Revelation. And yet, people look at this, they say, they say, mid-tribulation rapture, and I say, no, pre-tribulation rapture, I am I'm convinced of it, because God has not destined us for wrath, and if we are, as the Bible is teaching, at the midpoint, how much wrath has taken place so far? I mean, it's not just the seal judgments, which would be bad enough, but six of the seven trumpet judgments and all that, that breaks out. In fact, with the seventh trumpet judgment, we're also at the third woe 
There is a massive amount of the wrath of God that has been poured out. And again, I remind you, God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ. That is an unequivocal verse. And so there's no room for God's people to go into the wrath of the tribulation. And again, however, the mid-tribulation perspective says no, but, but this is when it happens. Well, first of all, let me ask you this. Where does this take place? Verses 11 through 19, where does this take place? In heaven. This is not an earthly event. This is a heavenly event that happens at the midpoint of the tribulation. Something else is happening on earth at this exact same time. I'll come back to that in a minute. And so this is happening in heaven. As, and as I just said, the seventh trumpet brings on the third woe. If you look at verse 14, it tells us the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. If you want to be certain about the three woes, where do those fall as you study through Revelation? It's trumpet five, six, and seven. So the last three trumpets are the three woes. What comes down at the blowing of those last three trumpets are three woes because woe, <laughs> woe to those who dwell on the earth as these three trumpets sound and bring the judgments that come with them. And yes, there is a judgment that comes along with the seventh trumpet, the third woe that we see in the, in the end there of verse 19, what, what shakes out on earth as this amazing coronation is happening up in the heavens. Let me ask you this. If the seventh trumpet is the third woe, is the rapture of the church for woe or for comfort? Is the rapture for woe or for comfort? Now, people can say, well, I can argue it both ways. It's comfort for those who are cut up, and it's woe for those on earth. There's nowhere that teaches that the rapture of the church is woe for those on earth. The Left Behind series teaches that. You know, people have the idea that when the church is caught up, airplanes are going to crash and cars are going to careen off of roads and there's going to be catastrophe and mayhem on the earth. We don't know that. It's a separate event when the Bible talks about the rapture of the church, the whole idea of the rapture. And I, I need to repeat this from time to time, especially for teenagers, because they get a little freaked out by the rapture. This is comfort. This is comfort. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, therefore, comfort one another with these words. The teaching of the rapture, the very idea of the rapture and the church being caught up is for comfort. Come to faith in Jesus. And none of these None of these tribulation wrath moments, none of these judgments will be for you. You will be caught up. Comfort one another with these words. Now, we can assume that the global response to the sudden withdrawal of the church may be distressing for many on the planet at that time. But the reality is the purpose of the Lord in the rapture of the church is to take up, not to terrify. The rapture is not to terrify the world. It's to take up the saints. It is to receive unto himself, not to ravage below. The tribulation is about ravaging. But remember that the rapture of the church and the tribulation are not even connected. The rapture doesn't kick off the tribulation. What, what kicks off the tribulation? The signing of the covenant by Antichrist with Israel. That signing of the covenant begins the ticking of the clock for the seven years, not the rapture. The rapture will happen at some point before that. Now, I say this every time. I think very quickly. You know, I think very soon after the rapture. I don't know if you can measure that in days, months, a year or two. I don't know. But the rapture does not kick off the seven-year tribulation. The rapture doesn't begin the wrath. The rapture is about comfort, the removal of God's people. So even to equate the seventh trumpet with the kind of woe that is talked about, it, it, it mischaracterizes the whole purpose of the rapture. And again, you might say, well, but Rick, people who are left behind are, are going to be distressed. Yeah, but the teaching of the rapture is for right now, that we would not be left behind, but rather would find great comfort in knowing our lot is with the Lord. Remember, God rescued Lot. So that makes sense. 
we are caught up to be with the Lord. And if you are sitting here listening, if you're paying attention tonight and you go, I don't know if I know the Lord, I've never made that, that commitment, I'm telling you right now, one of the most comforting things you can do is choose Jesus because you are guaranteed eternity and to be pulled out before the wrath of God comes. So the teaching of the rapture is, is a good teaching. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 52 tells us in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. But to equate the last trumpet and the rapture to the seventh trumpet and the third woe, again, misses the point of the promise. Comfort, encouragement, faith for the blessed hope that is coming before us. But again, let me stay here for a moment. There are those who think the seventh trumpet is the last trumpet. Others look at this section, Revelation chapter 11, and they say, well, the two witnesses, they get caught up. That's the rapture of the church. That when the two witnesses die and then are caught up, remember verse 12, they heard a loud voice from heaven say to them, come up here. And they went up into heaven in the cloud and their enemies watched them. And they would say, the come up here is the rapture call of Jesus. And it is the rapture call of Jesus, but he's already said it once back in chapter 4, verse 1. Long before this, three and a half years plus before this moment. Others say the two witnesses actually represent the church. Remember we talked about this last week, that some say the two witnesses are, are representations. They're not actually, well, Moses and Elijah, or I know some of you are team Enoch. I get it. Enoch and Elijah, you would say. Let me tell you a couple of things here. While some say the two witnesses represent the church, the Bible does not. What the Bible does is characterize the two witnesses with the function and power of two Hebrew prophets, Moses and Elijah. Now, again, Team Enoch, let me just say this to you all. Uh, whether it's Enoch or Moses is gonna make no difference in our getting caught up, okay? So we can walk together as family and that's not a problem, right, Hank? We can do that. Uh, but Team Enoch, Enoch was not a Hebrew prophet. And the two prophets, just the description, I, and if you just sit in Revelation 11 and look at the two prophets, you don't see an Enoch characterized in the miraculous. Now, could God teach Enoch or give Enoch the same power that he gave to Moses? Sure, he could. God can do whatever he wants. But I just wonder then, why does he so clearly characterize the miraculous power of these two prophets to reflect, as they do, Moses and Elijah? It looks so much like them that to not be them would kind of be, well, that, I, would, I would think that that would be unusual for the Lord, to paint a picture and say, oh, but that's not what you think. He's usually very good with the pictures that he paints for us and the things that he shows us. Now, I understand that Enoch and Elijah are the two that didn't die, in fact, fit the, the pattern, having been just caught up themselves, Elijah in the whirlwind, and Enoch was not, for he walked with God and God took him. But I want to throw a wrench into your thinking tonight that was actually given to me uh, by my sister Donna, so you can tell her less when you get home. She messed me up good. Uh, no, this is really important to think through with me. First of all, I understand, Enoch and Elijah neither one died, and so if you read Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed for men to die once and after this judgment. So since they did not die, they need to come back and die, and then comes judgment. I understand that uh, position. However, the church alive at the time that Jesus raptures the church will never die. So there's a whole group of people, if the rapture were to happen tonight, who will never taste death. The Bible says it is appointed for men to die once and then judgment. But there's a whole group of people who will never die. What does that tell you? That God can do whatever he wants. And that that verse doesn't bind us to a legalistic perspective that this is the way it must happen. We, if we're alive at the time of the rapture, if that's tonight, next week, next year, whatever, if we're alive, our earthly bodies will immediately be caught up and glorified in the process or perhaps glorified and then caught up, but it's gonna happen quickly and then we will never die. 
Now, if I happen to pass away before the rapture happens, of course, I will go first. But those alive at the time will never taste death. So to hang everything on Hebrews 9.27 and say, but it's appointed for men to die. Yes, it is appointed. But there are exceptions to the rule. And the greatest word for exception in the Bible is grace. Because by the standard of God's law, there are no exceptions to sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But he gives grace, which is the great exception. Now, now someone would say, and, and I've, I've been asked this question, if it's Moses, well, we can't die and be resurrected twice, can we? I would ask Jairus' daughter that question. I might ask the widow's son from Nain, or hey, ask Lazarus, can you die, be raised up, only to die to be raised up again? Yes. And not only in the New Testament, we have Old Testament pictures of those who died and were resurrected and who would then die again for ultimately, hopefully, if they die in faith, the coming resurrection. So yes, there are examples even in Scripture of those who die, like Moses. We know Moses died. We just don't know where he was buried. The Lord buried Moses somewhere up on Mount Pisgah, and no one knows where the body was. Satan wanted it. Remember Jude, chapter nine, or Jude verse 9, argued with Michael over the body of Moses. We went over that. But can a person die twice? Yeah, and be resurrected twice? Yes, but, and this is important, there is a difference between resurrection and ultimately glorification, okay? Lazarus was resurrected by Jesus back to life, but was not glorified. He was resurrected to mortality. That's different than my coming resurrection, which is a resurrection to immortality, or as I put it, glorification so those are two things now the coming resurrection for all believers is a resurrection unto immortality glorification that's what is out ahead of us once glorified then we no longer die we live now a number of people again have died twice only to resurrect twice first to life and then ultimately to glory. Am I losing anybody yet? Because I plan on losing a few tonight. That was a joke. I think I lost you right there. Okay, thing is, bottom line, God can do whatever he wants. He can do whatever he wants. So I can walk with Team Enoch. I just personally believe Moses is a better fit for the literal narrative here. Uh, where's the wrench? I was going to throw a wrench in the works. I, I'll, I'll do that in a minute. But back to the coronation. Note this. The two witnesses are caught up before the seventh trumpet sounds, right? They're caught up before the second woe, not when the seventh trumpet sounds, which produces the third woe. So the two witnesses can have nothing to do. Their rapture has nothing to do with the seventh trumpet because they're already gone before it's blown. All right? So again, when I'm... I'm kind of pulling apart a little bit this idea that the seventh trumpet is the last trumpet and the two witnesses are involved with the mid-tribulation rapture. They're two different things that are happening at different times. The seventh trumpet, however, resounds with the declaration of Christ's authority. Again, where? In heaven. The declaration of the authority of Christ and the coming kingdom in heaven and then it's followed by yet another woeful shaking on the earth below. So walk this through with me for a moment here. Verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded. There were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever when it says the kingdom of this world, it is in the singular form. It's the word basileia in the Greek. Note that the kingdom of the world, one kingdom. It doesn't say the kingdoms of the world or even the nations of the world. This describes at this moment, midway into the tribulation, a one world kingdom, which would then be under a one world ruler. If you look back at verse two, again, of chapter 11, it says, 
Leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, plural. And they, plural, will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. So there are nations, one kingdom. One kingdom that is now being overtaken. The kingdom of the world is being consumed by the kingdom of the Christ. One kingdom. Why? Because there's one hijacked authority. There's one completely demonic kingdom that is in play right now. This is not the kingdom. Anyone who believes that we, the church, are the kingdom in the world now has not read the headlines, is not living on planet Earth right now. This is not the kingdom of Christ. Matthew 4, verse 8 tells us again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Meaning what? Meaning they were the devils to give. Meaning he had usurped authority, still does to this day. Jesus called him the, the God of this world, the ruler of this world. It's, it's his. And by the way, the devil will promise you, promise me all kinds of worldly success and power and authority and then he'll rip it away when his stealing, killing and destroying agenda takes precedent for him. So he's, he's duplicitous. And, and I'm, I'm saying this right now about the Basileia, the singular kingdom of the world that is in play right now is the kingdom of darkness. I'm saying it to ask the question, when will we realize this? When will we, follower of Jesus, realize this is what we're living in? Now, the world's a beautiful place. We, we took the puppies for a walk today, and it was glorious, mostly. Sunshine. I love this time of year. The air is so pure. Not in L.A., but up here. And, and I love, you know, Washington State when the sun is brightly beaming. It's beautiful. Still the kingdom of darkness. Still the world in which evil is in play and running. Still an existence in which our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. The kingdom of Christ, midway into the tribulation, this is when this begins to take place. This is when the kingdom of this world is beginning to be overcome. Not today. You know, if, if we were caught up and the tribulation began tomorrow, it would still be three and a half years of the kingdom of darkness overrunning this world. Quick question with that being the case and the fact that we are yet in the kingdom of darkness, how do believers cope? How do we deal with this? How, how do we... How do we fight? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. How do we fight? How do we keep our heads above water in so much darkness? I give you three suggestions here, just three verses. Matthew chapter four, verse 10, Jesus said to Satan, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's number one way to fight. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. We've been singing that new song, Praise. One of the lines in it talks about my praise is a weapon. And it is. It's a way of fighting back, of pushing back the darkness when you're worshiping God and recognizing, even as we do in the coronation tonight, he is God Almighty. He is in control. In the worst of the worst situations of life, he is still greater than all. He is still capable of dealing with anything no matter how much we may have messed it up. He is still God. Worship the Lord your God, Jesus says, and serve him only. John chapter 12, verse 31. Jesus said, now judgment is upon this world, and the ruler of this world will be cast out. He promised that 2,000 years ago. And then Jesus said this, and I, if I am lifted up from this earth, will draw all men to myself. So not only do we worship the Lord and serve him only, but we are drawn to Jesus. How do Jesus' people fight the spiritual darkness in this world? We draw near to Jesus. 
we get as close to him as possible. We follow him. We listen to him. We pray to him. We stay in his presence. And from there, he does the fighting. Jesus also said in John 18, 36, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting, so I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Third thing that you can do, focus on the coming kingdom. Know that the kingdom is before us, not around us in this moment. Is, is now and not yet. It's now in our hearts. It's now in our worship. It's now in our prayers. It's now in our faith. It's then in terms of actuality. But that kingdom's coming. So no matter how dark it gets in this kingdom, in this world, this Basileia right now, I look at the world and go, it's not a problem. Kingdom's coming. Trust that the kingdom is coming. At the midpoint of the tribulation, as this coronation is taking place in heaven, something very different is taking place on planet Earth. Let me remind you of this again. Daniel 9, 27, Antichrist will make a firm covenant with the many for one seven. But in the middle of the seven, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, which means it was reinstated at the temple in Jerusalem for a short time under the covenant agreement that he brings to the people of Israel. Now he puts a stop to it on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Jesus described this further back in Matthew uh, chapter 24, verse 15. 500 years now after Daniel, Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, and then it says, let the reader understand. I love that. I don't know if, if Matthew added that in to say, hey, hey, pay attention to what Jesus is saying, or if Jesus said that at the time, knowing it would be written for the reader to understand, which would be really cool but because that means He'd be talking to his disciples and he'd say, let the reader understand. And they go, the reader? What's he talking about? But then Jesus continues. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his own house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight will not be in winter or on a Sabbath. We'll talk about that flight when we get into chapter 12. But verse 21 says, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. And that is key. That is key. When Jesus describes the great tribulation, he says this is something that has never happened before, nor will ever happen again. And those who say, well, it happened in A.D. 70. How do you explain the Holocaust, which was worse? How do you explain any of the pogroms and tribulations and persecutions of the Jewish people that followed the Holocaust later or preceded all around ever since for the last 2,000 years, all the stuff that's come since AD 70? The Jewish people have been under persecution ever since, and the Holocaust caps it all as the worst of the worst of the worst that has ever happened to Israel, and Jesus says, when you see this take place, this is something yet future. The Holocaust, listen to me, doesn't even compare to what is coming in the tribulation for the children of Israel. And I say that with with great sorrow, but that is a reality that Scripture teaches. 2 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 Paul describing that same thing. I know I've read a couple of these verses recently, but we got to get this in your, in your minds here. Let no one in any way deceive you, for the day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy or the departure, or both, comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Daniel, Jesus, and Paul all agree on the description of the midpoint 
of the seven-year tribulation. And at that midpoint on earth, and it's so ironic, on the earth, Antichrist sits down in the temple, the abomination of desolation in Jerusalem on planet earth and says, I am God. And he takes his seat as being God. And at the same time, concurrently in the heaven, you and I now know Jesus is being coronated. The Christ is taking his authority back. Through the first even three and a half years of the tribulation, Jesus allows that that usurped authority to be running rampant on the earth. But at that midpoint, it's done. And those in heaven at the time declare it. By the way, those in heaven, I think, involves us. So this coronation song that we're about to read (laughs) is another time in heaven when we are reading about a song that we will be singing at the time. This is such a cool, Kelsey and I were talking about this. This is a time loop. I don't know how else to describe it. John, from 2,000 years ago, is launched forward in the vision of what's going to happen ahead of us. And we will be singing and praising God at that time. And John's singing it then, though we will be praising at that time. By the way, John will too. I still wonder. I mean, I I geek out on stuff, weird stuff like this. When John sees all the people in heaven worshiping, does he see himself? Oh, there I am. I mean, he never says that. Maybe God just doesn't allow him to see himself because that would really freak him out. But you got to realize that God's outside of time here and in heaven, in heaven, coronation. On earth, self-declaration of coronation by the Antichrist himself. Goes into the temple, declares himself God, demands worship. By that point, all the political pretense of the Antichrist will be pointless. All the game playing, the mask comes off and he says, I am God, I am in charge. Daniel chapter 11 verse 36 says, then the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every God and will speak monstrous things against the God of gods. And he will prosper until the indignation, that's an Old Testament word for tribulation, until the indignation is finished for that which is decreed will be done. So, to clarify, the abomination of desolation is an act so vile that it will defile, it's so abominable that it will desolate the temple sanctuary at the midpoint of the tribulation. Well, that's where we are right now. And as we read that, and by the way, that's this this section, John has reached the midpoint. Some of what we've talked about in chapter 11 is looking back. The two witnesses over the first three and a half years got up to this point until they die and are resurrected and are caught up, and then this happens. So now we're at this midpoint, and chapters 11 and 12 and into 13 and 14, so much of what's described is all described at this point so we understand what is coming next, what will begin to unfold and take place in the rest of the tribulation period. But for all of this evil and horror on planet Earth at the same time, this glorious coronation sounds up in heaven. So again, we begin with the coronation of the anointed king. I'll give you four things to jot down. That's the first one. The coronation of the anointed king as this begins, and then the next thing we hear is, number two, the celebration of awestruck subjects. The celebration of awestruck subjects, verse 16, and the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. So in this moment, from the streets of Jerusalem, it's like John follows the path of the two witnesses. They've been caught up. And he's back to this heavenly uh, coronation celebration As he hears the 24 elders worshiping, again, we talked about in the chapters four and five, I believe the 24 elders do represent the church. I think there are 24 actual elders worshiping around the throne, and yet in representation of the church that is also present in heaven, because in chapter five, they're all singing the song of the redeemed, the redeemed around the throne. That's the church. And so here they are representing the church. And I I tell you that to say, verse 16 in chapter 11 is the only possible 
the only possible glimpse of the church in the entire tribulation, chapter 6 through 19, or 219. This is the only time you could say, that might be the church. There's no other place where the church could even be suggested during the tribulation on earth. The only time we see the possible potential of the church present is in heaven, which is where we will be at this time. And again, I believe part of this coronation, singing this glorious song, verse 17, we give thanks O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And this is the moment, listen, this is the moment of the great breaking of satanic power. Coronation of the Christ breaks the stranglehold of Satan. This is the retaking of all godly authority at this midpoint of the seven years. Part of how we know that is in the next chapter, you're going to see Satan ultimately finally disqualified from heaven once and for all, his visa revoked, his, his rear end kicked out of heaven, sent down to the earth where he just loses it. Why does that happen? Because Jesus is king. Because Jesus, at this point, takes hold of his authority once and for all. It's not his return yet, but it is his authority. I'll show you more of that here in just a moment. But did you notice, by the way, the, the change in verse 17 of the divine progression? If you think back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Revelation 1, 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 4, verse 8, the four living creatures do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty. We just sang this. Who was and who is and who is to come. How would it have been tonight if we had gone, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is. Now see, they don't sing that here. Look again at verse 17. O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and, her, and who were and it stops. They don't sing who is to come. This is an interesting change. Why don't they sing who is to come? Because as far as they're concerned, he's on his way. The coming has begun. Now it'll be a move of three and a half years because as he takes his coronated position of authority, there's some cleaning of house that has to take place before he sets foot on planet Earth. The final cleaning will be what we call Armageddon. But until that point, Jesus now takes his rightful authority over all things and there will be a pouring out of the wrath of God by the authority of Jesus over the final three and a half years. The heavenly focus here is no longer on his coming. Who was and is and is to come. No, who was and is. He is. I am. He is now. This is not about what is coming anymore because we've come to the point when he is, period. I love this. It's not, they're not looking forward to his coming it, 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 like it was among the tribulation saints. Remember what they were asking? How long, O Lord? Have you ever asked that question? <laughs> How long, O Lord? When is he coming? I can't wait for him to come. Oh, I just wish Jesus would come. But once this happens, once it takes place, you're not looking for his coming anymore. You're just looking for him. And so they're looking at him as I am. And in this coronation celebration, the redeemed around the throne are praising the very rule of God and his Christ, by the way, as one and the same king. God and his Christ are being worshiped and coronated. Now I'm gonna explain, again, I'm gonna explain this further. We got a little more to go here. But all this celebrating in heaven actually provokes a very different response on the earth. Not only the mess that Antichrist is creating at that point, but there's a provocation here of the glory as this coronation begins, as the seventh angel sounds. And by the way, I think people on the earth are gonna be very aware of this coronation. Why? Verse 18, and the nations were enraged. This is a reaction on earth 
to what is taking place in heaven. And the nations were enraged. So this is number three in your notes. I call this the conniption of angry rebellion. This is a rebellious conniption. It's the polar opposite on earth of the heavenly praise and thanksgiving that's taking place in heaven as the saints around the throne, as the redeemed sing, we give thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who were, who are and who were, because you've taken your great power and have begun to reign. You know, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. They're singing praise to God in heaven, and they are raging against the Lord on earth. The word enraged, the nations were enraged. It's orgathesan, and it literally means a provoked ire. So it's, it's anger, but it's provoked anger. It's stirred up anger. It's incited anger. In fact, Aristotle referred to this kind of anger as, quote, desire mixed with grief. It's passionate anguish. It is fuming misery. Desire mixed with grief. The desire is for world domination and control. The desire is to own myself, to be king of me, to do what I want to do. That's the desire. The grief is the realization that all of that is gone. That there is one who is coronated as king. But this, this ire, this enraged anger is feeble and it's weak. The nations rage because they're losing control. And so, by the way, is their reprehensible leader. In fact, look over at chapter 12. Just, just a quick peek. Chapter 12, verse 17, that uses the same word enraged of the devil. The dragon was enraged with the woman. We'll find out who she is next Wednesday. And went off to make war with the rest of her children. We'll find out who they are next Wednesday who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. The dragon was enraged. Orgus Thesson, same word. But, but this, this rage is gutless. It's a powerless rage. And again, this is all happening concurrently. Power is being stripped from evil pride. Authority is ripped from the wicked authoritarian. And the result is rage. Uh, Proverbs 19, verse 3, says the foolishness of man ruins his way and his heart rages against the Lord. That's when you know a heart is really going hard, when it rages against the Lord. And that's what's happening on planet Earth at this time. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 21, another prophecy of, I believe, this event. They will pass through the land hard-pressed and famished, and it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. Their king, Antichrist. Their God, the Lord. They're just cursing everyone. You know, it's like when you elect a president, you think he's going to make everything right. In three and a half years, gas prices are exactly where they were two years ago. And, and there's a certain amount of rage. But you said you'd fix things. Antichrist is going to claim to be able to fix things. The world is going to line up behind him. They're gonna, he's going to be such a diplomat, Daniel describes. A great orator. He's going to be slick. He's going to be believable. He's going to come up with phenomenal peace plans and everybody's going to jump on board. Three and a half years in, everybody is enraged and Daniel even prophesies against Antichrist. You're going to have nations coming from the east and the west both coming to gather and fight Antichrist. In fact, did you know Armageddon begins his war on earth? It's a world war with Antichrist as the object of everyone's hatred in that moment until Jesus comes. And then Antichrist is done away with because the devil's done with him. And the whole thing ends up at Armageddon. The rage of rebellion that's described here is the outward demonstration of the inwardly hard heart. This rage is set against this. <laughs> Amazing to say this. This rage is set against the same Jesus who died for these people who died so that they didn't have to, who took the full weight of the wrath of God on his shoulders so that they could have been saved if they would repent. Same for us today. 
Same for us today. The Jesus that people rage against is the same Jesus who stretched out his arms on the cross and was nailed up so that we could be free from our sin. It's, it's an insane rage. By the way, something else happened long ago that began to ignite this world rebellion that we see come to a head in the midpoint of the tribulation. Something the ancient prophets declared multiple times. Go back with me. Don't turn there. Just listen. Keep your finger in Revelation 11. Just listen. You've heard this many times. But go back with me to Nazareth. It's Shabbat. Come with me into the synagogue. When Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through all the surrounding district and he began teaching in their synagogues and he was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. As, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on Shabbat and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he stops mid-verse closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him, wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? And things begin to unravel that day. Before Jesus claimed to be Messiah, he taught. And in all the synagogues and where he went as he taught, they went, wow, he's a great teacher. Man, this guy's fascinating. We got to listen to him, follow him. This, could he be the Messiah? Was even being asked. Then he declares himself Messiah, quotes from Isaiah to do that. And the hometown crowd that was first impressed with his gracious words then got confused and ultimately, ultimately become murderously violent. These same people who knew him growing up as a boy now drive him out to the very edge, the precipice of Nazareth to push him off. Jesus walked right through them and he went on his way. Some say that was supernatural. Others say, no, it was just authority. He was done with the moment and walked right through them. Why do people rage against Jesus? Why do they rage against him? Why do people get angry even when some of you have mentioned the name of Jesus? Why do they rage rather than revere this Jesus who did nothing but teach wonderfully, do remarkable miracles, show great compassion, and die on a cross for us? Why rage against him? Well, David wondered the same thing. Listen to this. In the second Psalm, why do the nations rage? The NASB actually translates that. Why are the nations in an uproar? The nations are the goyim, the Gentiles. Why are the Gentiles in an uproar? But the word uproar is ragash, and in the Hebrew, that's the equivalent word to the Greek word I told you, which is rage. Why are the nations in a rage? And the people's devising a vain thing. David says, this doesn't make sense. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers mutter together, take counsel together, against the Lord and against his anointed, his Mashiach in the Hebrew. They rage against the Lord's anointed, Jesus Christ. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Well, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger. And terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord, David writes. He said to me, Jesus speaking, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance. To the very ends of the earth is your possession. That's interesting. That's what Satan offered him. I'll give you the world, I'll give you the nations for your possession. Just worship me. God had already made that promise to Jesus. He already said, I'm going to give that to you. Jesus trusted his father first. 
He says, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence. Rage or reverence, that's the choice. The psalm begins with the nations raging. It ends with a call to all people to revere the Lord and rejoice with trembling, to do homage to the Son that he not become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Would you note that for ours really quickly? It starts with rage. Why do you rage? I mean, you can apply this to yourself when you're frustrated with the things of God not going your way. Why do you rage? And the psalm ends, revere the Lord, rejoice with trembling. How blessed are all who take refuge in his name. Those are the keys, reverence and rejoicing and refuge, not the rage that we so often see. Why do they rage against Jesus? Back to that question, why raging against the Lord? Because he's the anointed one. What do you mean? Because he's the anointed one and you're not. I mean, mean, not you, but you understand what I'm saying. He's the anointed one. You don't have the authority. He has the authority. He He is the God who will take control of this world. The word anoint, you all know, Mashiach or Mashach in the Hebrew, which becomes Mashiach, Messiah. In the Greek, Creo, which becomes Christos, the Christ. Note this first First, he came to the earth as the anointed, right? He came as the anointed, he came as the Messiah. Then Jesus became the begotten. I've said this before, note this, he wasn't the begotten in his birth. He didn't become the only begotten son because he was begat in birth. He became begotten in his resurrection. How do we know? Acts 13, verse 32, Paul says, we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my my son, today I have begotten you. So in his resurrection, Jesus was begotten. So track with me, he comes to the earth and he's anointed. In his resurrection, he is begotten. Psalm 110 verse 1 says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's the current situation. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. And at that point, number three, he will be coronated. He came anointed. He became begotten. He will be coronated. And that's what we begin to see right here in chapter 15 The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. At the same moment, Satan's power and authority is revoked. Again, we'll see in chapter 12. The servants of Christ in heaven rejoice. The nations on earth rage. This rebellious heart rages. It's wary of Jesus. In fact, that's what the rebellious heart does. It complains, it doubts. It mistrusts, and ultimately it hates Jesus Christ. Verse 18. Well, wait, before I go any further, let me just ask you. Are you thankful for his rule over your life? Or do you find yourself pushing back? Are you grateful that he is God and you are not? When you think about Jesus, when you talk to Jesus, are they words of thanksgiving and praise and honor that is due his name? Or are they words of, you owe me an explanation? What is the outward demonstration of the inward heart? Because here in Revelation 11, the outward demonstration of the heart of mankind is rage. What's your outward demonstration? Well, verse 18 continues that the nations were enraged And your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and to reward the bondservants, the prophet, your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. There's a word play here, by the way. The word play, 
saying that the nations were enraged. It is the same word that John uses when he says, and your wrath came. The nations were enraged, or guess the son. The word wrath is the root word, which is orge, and it is God's wrath. And here's the difference. Humanity's rage is impotent and pathetic and powerless. God's wrath is omnipotent and effective and accomplishes everything that needs to be accomplished. So while those in angry rebellion are having a knip on the earth and it's an empty, wasted conniption, number four, we come to the confidence. Note this, it's important. The confidence of the faithful worshiper. The confidence of the faithful worshiper. Note this, he says, your wrath came. It will. The time for the dead to be judged, it's certain. The rewarding of his, of his bond servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, the small and the great, absolutely assured. And number four, to destroy those who destroy the earth whether by drones, missiles, rockets, or even by foolishly thinking that we can regulate and save the planet? Have you noticed that, that the attempts of man to try to regulate the environment only end up damaging it? And he is going to destroy those who destroy the earth. And as he describes all these things, I mean, I read verse 18, and, and maybe some of you are already there ahead of me. You're going... Man, but this sounds so immediate and conclusive three and a half years in. It sounds like this is the moment when it's all done, which would blow away, Pastor Rick, your chronological view of Revelation. If it all happens right here, well, then it's kind of all just all over the place. And it's all, maybe it is allegorical. And, and it kind of, if you're in that place going, this is making me uncomfortable here, well, listen. If we still have 11 chapters and 42 months yet to go. Why do they say this here? It is the confidence of the faithful worshipers. It's the confidence. They are stating what is absolutely assured as having already been done. This is how it works. The continuing praise of Verse 15 says, the loud voices in heaven. Verse 16 says, the elders. There's this, this massive coronation worship going on and as far as they're all confidently concerned at this moment, this is done. Done deal. This is the moment when all heaven recognizes the authority and control of Jesus taking over. It's all done. Everything that he said would happen, it's as good as finished. Now, if you're thinking that sounds great, but it's still just your opinion, Rick, well, let me Greek out for you for a minute. The entire coronation song is bursting with aorist verb tenses. Aorist verbs in the Greek. And I've mentioned the aorist verb tense before. It's an interesting verb tense that's difficult to translate into English. Because the aorist tense, it's a verb, verb form literally of, quote, unqualified past tense. So it's often written in past tense, but it's an unqualified past tense. Meaning what? Meaning it's, past tense but with no specific duration it's past tense in in explanation but there's no completion of the action the best way to, to describe it i'll give you another word we've used before it's one of my favorite words it's a proleptic verb a proleptic verb what does proleptic mean let me give you an example ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 says god paul is writing god being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're already seated in heaven. But we're not already seated in heaven. How can Paul say that? It's a proleptic statement. Paul is speaking with such absolute assurance of grace that we will be seated in heaven that he says you already are. We're as good as there. It's kind of like me on the day before my vacation. I'm already gone. 
You know, I'm home, but I'm gone. And Paul says, you're there. If you have been saved by the grace of God in Christ Jesus, you're saved. You're there. You're seated. You're already worshiping. And in fact, we're reading it tonight in chapter 11. You're already worshiping and coronating Jesus because it's a done deal. This is the confidence of faithful worshipers. So let me, going back to verse 15, or, um, or it, yeah, verse 15, because the whole coronation song is bursting with aorist verb tenses. Verse 15, the kingdom of the world has become, that's the aorist tense, the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Verse 16, they fell on their faces and worshiped God. That's in the aorist tense. Have, you have begun to reign, verse 17. That's in the Arab tense. The nations were enraged. That's in the aorist tense. Your wrath came, aorist. The time came to judge, to reward, to destroy. Aorist, aorist, aorist. So the whole thing is in that very unique Greek verb tense that is say, stating this is as good as done. So we're going to sing it as though it's done because it's as good as done. That's the idea here. And it's a powerful way to worship, to worship the finished work of Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus, someone brought this up in our staff meeting today. Jesus said, to talus die. It is finished. Was it? Yes. But it took me a while to get there. I wasn't born redeemed, were you? It took me a while to come to the point of recognizing my need for redemption and then to receive redemption in the blood work of Jesus Christ. And by the way, he is still working on me. You know, I, I'm thankful, as Paul said, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. That's still a work in progress. But Jesus said it is finished. How could he say that? Because it was. Because there is absolute assurance in the finished work of Jesus. You know, it's kind of like Southerners. No offense from the, for those of you who are from the South, but Southerners are always fixing to get ready to do something. Why don't you just do it? Well, we're fixing to go. We're fixing to get ready. To, and and that, actually, they're not fixing to get ready to do something. They're just living in the errorist verb tense. So they're actually Greek scholars. The kingdom of this world, therefore, is fixing to become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. That's the way this comes off. So this is the coronation, it's so important, of the faithful worshiper's confidence. And I've been thinking about this all week. Man, do we worship with that kind of confidence? That done deal confidence. Cam brought this up today. I love this passage. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked of him, from him. Do you have that kind of confidence? It's the confidence of a faithful worshiper. It's the confidence that we hear projected in this coronation song in heaven at this time. And we have heard this confidence, by the way, throughout the revelation so far. In fact, think back with me for a moment. And you can follow or just listen. But go back to Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You made them, or us, it can go either way, to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they, or we, will reign upon the earth. I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and living creatures and elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And of course, every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. And the four living creatures kept saying amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. You know what that is? That's a pre-tribulation coronation. 
This is coronation. This is a coronation song of Jesus Christ that he would have dominion forever and ever. So it's a pre-tribulation coronation. Skip ahead to chapter 11, verse 15, and what you have and what we've read and what we're studying is a mid-tribulation coronation. One before the tribulation began, and now one right in the middle where the heavens bust open with this amazing coronation. By the way, <laughs> man, I'm throwing stuff at you tonight. I, I, I don't apologize. Um, the first, the pre-tribulation coronation of Jesus here is a priestly coronation because you have made us to be priests and we will rule and reign with him and so this is a coronation that is priestly keep that in mind it's a priestly coronation as the little lamb slain is worthy to break the seals and he begins to judge so that's the pre-tribulation coronation is priestly the mid-tribulation coronation is prophetic this is a prophetic coronation. The kingdom of the world is becoming the kingdom of Christ. The handover of power and authority has begun in this moment, but it is still prophetic. For those of us tonight who are still awaiting the king, hang in there. Hang in there. Be confident. He's coming. Kingdom's coming. It is on the way. For those who are raging against the king in rebellion, beware the end is near. Both need to have heads up. So a priestly coronation, Revelation 5, verses 9 through 14, a mid-tribulation prophetic coronation here in chapter 11. Skip ahead to chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. I'm going to go ahead and read it because we may be a while before we get there unless we're caught up. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, the salvation and the glory and the power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous for he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality. Who's that? We'll talk about that later. And he has avenged the blood of his bond servants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders, there they are again, and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. And a voice kept coming from the throne saying, give praise to our God. It's, by the way, keep on praising our God. All you his bond servants, you who fear him, the small and the great, I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and the sound, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, hallelujah, for the Lord, our God, the Almighty reigns. Third coronation. Three coronations, pre-trib, which is priestly, uh, mid-trib, which is prophetic, and post-trib, which is kingly. This is a royal, kingly coronation, this fourfold hallelujah as the king literally sets foot on the earth, returns to rule and to reign, planting his feet on Mount Moriah as Zechariah chapter 14 prophesies and coming for the kingdom. Three coronations. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Three coronations, priestly, prophetic, kingly. He is the priest, he is the prophet, he is the king. Three coronations. And what's so amazing about this is Jesus confirms his connection as the anointed one, as Christos, as Mashiach. He confirms here, this book confirms his connection to David, who as the first king by God's choice of Israel, yes, Saul was before him, but God chose David. And as that first choice of a king, there's this coronation connection. Do you remember this from our study in First and Second Samuel? That Samuel came along and anointed David as a kid. They had to pull him out of the sheepfolds of Bethlehem and get him there before his father when his other brothers didn't measure up to what God was looking for, which was the heart. They called David in, and in 1 Samuel 16, he is anointed to be king. And that anointing of David, he was probably, uh, Hebrew scholars say, seven years old. Just a boy. But he was anointed first time. David was anointed a second time. 
perhaps as much as two decades later as king over Judah, 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 4. A second anointing, a second coronation, if you will, first anointing as a boy, second over the tribe of Judah, and then he was anointed a third time. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 3, as king over all Israel, he was crowned then king in Hebron over the entirety of the nation. So we see this progressive anointing of David as he grows to the point of finally taking full rule over all of Israel. We see a progressive anointing of Jesus Christ. That pattern plays out with the son of David. His rule recognized now three times in the book of Revelation. His rule recognized in his anointing in his first coming and his begottenness in his resurrection and his coronation as king. And we hear again the coronation of priest and of prophet and of king and Solomon. Oh, listen to the wise words of Solomon. Psalm 132 verse 17 says, there in Zion I will cause the horn of David to spring forth. That is the authority of David to spring forth. I have prepared a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall shine. And by the way, in this moment of coronation, mid-tribulation in the book of Revelation, something begins to shine. Look at verse 19. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes and lightning and sounds, and sounds as voices, by the way, and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. The third woe hits on earth below. As at the same time, the temple in heaven is opened, and the ark of his covenant is seen in the temple. And I personally do believe that those on earth can see it. I think that's the implication here in verse 19 of the temple of God being opened. Now listen, I'm almost done here. But I want you to get this because this is the place I wanted to land on Sunday. Sunday we, we talked about the Ark of the Covenant, right? And we ended up here, the Ark of his covenant. Last time the ark is mentioned here, it's a beautiful place this time in, in Revelation, and it's the ark of his covenant, the only time it's called that. But we went back on Sunday, and we did the entire ark of the ark, if you will, okay? The history of the ark of the covenant. The week before that, we did the history of the temple of God ending up with this temple, the temple of God, which is in heaven, being open. We talked about the seven temples in Scripture. And then we looked at the ark and, and, and its journey through the Scripture. And, and I remind you, to study the book of Revelation is to study the Bible. You can't get through this book. Well, I mean, I guess you can. You could do a summary, cursory, glancing off the surface, superficial study of Revelation and miss everything. But to truly understand and, and enjoy this book, you got to study the entire Word of God. That's what I love about Revelation. This is why I've said I would start a, a new believer in the book of Revelation because you get so much Bible all at once. And so there, there was reason for going back to the Jewish temple in biblical history and the Ark of the Covenant in uh, ancient biblical history as well. Important to understand, to know that history and bring you to the present. But for all of the importance of knowing that, we got to the end Sunday and I went home and I just... There are times where I'm kind of, you think you're spinning. You think Rick is unloaded on you. I go home and, I, and I'll sit down and go, Cheryl, I don't even know what I talked about tonight. There was so much. And I was just flying. And, and I, I hope it was biblical. I hope they're following. Hope they're testing every word. The Sunday I went home and I'm kind of like, man, it's great information on the ark. And such a blessing to go back through. I'm just talking my own experience and, and recount what's happened with the ark and, and, and even some of the suppositions of where the ark of the covenant might be and to end with the ark in heaven, wow. And then the week before to go over the temple and review all of that stuff and, and we can really get caught up. As I believe I said recently, we can get really caught up in the information so much that we miss the revelation. That was my experience Sunday. A lot of good information about the ark and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting at home going, but what was the revelation Jeremy said beautifully today, earlier on, he, he said, well, the revelation was Jesus. 
Well, right, and I said that, but I always say that. Well, Rick, you always say that because it's always true. Well, I know, yeah, because it is. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me, you know? It is these that testify of me. So, yeah, it is all about Jesus, but I, I was thinking, is there something, Lord, that I'm missing here? Listen to this. Remember the temple and the ark. They are shadowy representations of everything in heaven. The actual gold-covered box, the chest, the Ark of the Covenant on earth, acacia wood gold-covered, represents something else. We talked about Jesus, right? The temple on earth is a shadowy representation of that which is in heaven. In fact, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 says, When Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained the eternal redemption. Awesome. And he goes on and says, if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh... How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Down in verse 24, the Hebrew pastor says, for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Jesus would have had to have suffered often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. We are coming to that which is real. This is not. This life, this world, this experience is a shadowy at best representation of what is real, of what we are coming to in the heavenly places that has been blood-bought, washed, and redeemed. We have been redeemed to enter that place by the blood of Jesus. So, in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, the temple of God is opened like the veil was torn, right? Until that point, nobody could go in. But the high priest, once a year, trembling with the blood of the sin offering to sprinkle it seven times on the mercy seat and hope he didn't do it wrong for fear of death. Nobody else could go in there. From tabernacle to temple to temple, nobody could go to the Holy of Holies. It was closed until Jesus died. And then it was rent. The Bible says from top to bottom as the, the, the hands of God himself took hold of the top and just ripped it right down the middle. The symbology of that is fantastic. The Holy of Holies is open. The blood of Christ has now bought the way into the most holy place possible. And so in Revelation eleven nineteen, 19, think this through with me. Get, if you can, a mental picture that here's the temple and the temple just opens. The veil is torn. There is no veil. The temple is open. How do I know there's no veil? Because you look into the temple and you see the ark of his covenant at the very heart of the whole thing. You know what the ark really represents? It represents on earth the shadowy representation of the Father's heart in Jesus Christ. It is at the center of all Jewish worship. That's the focal point. That's where it narrows down to the holy of holies that no Jew could even go into. But it's the Ark of the Covenant with the sprinkled blood on the mercy seat. That's where their hope is. That's where the Lord said, I would meet with you. And so what we see here in this picture of, of Revelation eleven nineteen, 19, the temple is opened and the heart of God right in the middle is there to be seen. 
I think about this, and what blows my mind is this is God opening his arms wide to welcome his children and gather us to the most precious part of who he is, to gather us into his heart, to bring us eye to eye. Sometimes we do, sometimes it goes well, other times it's Mars and Venus, you know, we just can't, can't get there. And, and other times it's, it becomes a, a broken situation. But even in the best of all possible marriages, there are times where the husband and wife can't quite get into each other's hearts. When God opens the temple and Christ is coronated and the ark of his covenant is visible for all, it is as though the Lord is saying, I'm home to my heart. Chicks under open John 1 verse as many as received to them gave the right to parents who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but born of God the coronation of Jesus Christ in Revelation 11 the opening of the temple and the ark within spells confidence to all who believe assurance this is a done deal. God will bring you home. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word, and I pray, Lord, we often ask that you would increase our faith. Kind of like the apostle said, Lord, increase our faith. Father, I want to sharpen that tonight and simply ask, increase our confidence. Increase our confidence. When you give signs and visions, when you give not even just representations, but here, Lord, when you open up for all to see, you are the only God who opens himself to be known. And so give us confidence, Lord, that we are known by you and we will know you even as we ourselves are fully known in that day. We join our voices with the coronation of Jesus Christ. We do so right now, pre-tribulation. <laughs> we want to be among those praising you and coronating you, Lord Jesus, mid-tribulation, and we want to be shouting hallelujahs of that final coronation post-tribulation when you return and all your saints with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Um, if you have questions, I'm, I'm here for a few minutes. Pray together. Have a great evening.